Welcome to our channel where we talk all things true crime. This video is for educational purposes based on public knowledge. We do give our opinions at the end, but please do your own research. We mean no disrespect for any mispronunciation of names or places. Let's get started. Dennis Rader is an American serial killer that terrorized the Wichita, Kansas area for years. Rader is also known as BTK, which is a name he gave himself. The B stands for bind, T is for torture, and K is for kill. Rader also loved sending the police and media outlets taunting letters describing his crimes. This ultimately led to his arrest. Dennis Rader was born March 9, 1945 in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Rader was raised in Wichita, Kansas. His parents worked long hours and rarely had time to spend with their children. Rader is the youngest out of four brothers. Rader reported that he had felt ignored by his mother and resented her for it. In interviews, Rader identified incidents as a child where his mother had humiliated or shamed him. He said these were motivators in his sadistic sexual fantasies that included torturing and bondage. He later claimed that he had killed animals as a youth. There were no major traumas or abuse in his childhood. He graduated from high school and attended a local university. He dropped out after a year and joined the military. Rader served in the U.S. Air Force from 1966 to 1970, reaching the rank of Staff Sergeant. He returned to Wichita after leaving the Air Force. Rader then started working at an IGA supermarket, which was the same one that his mother was a bookkeeper. In 1971, he married Paula Dietz. They had two children, Carrie and Brian. He worked briefly as a factory worker at Coleman Company. He went back to school and Rader earned his Bachelor of Science, majoring in Administration of Justice in 1979. Rader started working at ADT Security Services in Wichita from 1974 to 1988. He installed security alarms and in many cases for homeowners that were worried about the BTK killing. In 1989, he was a census field operations supervisor, and in 1991, he was a dog catcher and compliance officer in Park City. Rader was a member of the Christ Lutheran Church in Wichita. He was elected president of the church council and was also a Cub Scout leader. On the outside, Rader was a family man, a church leader, and a government worker. He was smart enough to hide in plain sight and avoid detection of the horrible crimes he was committing to fulfill his sexual desires. He took immense pleasure in the headlines that announced his disgusting acts and his messages that he sent to the media. Rader also was able to control his impulses and stop before authorities got too close to his trail. Rader was 28 when he committed his first murder on January 15, 1974. He strangled four family members of the Oteros, and this included two children in their home. Rader severed the phone line and entered the house. Three of the older siblings discovered the bodies when they came home from school. None of the victims were essayed, but bodily fluids were found at the scene. Rader took a watch from the home as a souvenir. The mother was a former co-worker at Coleman Company. Rader attacked another Coleman employee, Catherine Bright. When Catherine returned home with her brother, Kevin, they found Raider waiting with a gun. Kevin was shot in the head. Luckily, somehow he survived. Unfortunately, Catherine was stabbed to death by Raider. In October 1974, a young man allegedly confessed to the killings of the Oteros with two friends. Raider didn't like someone else trying to take credit for his work. An editor at the Wichita Eagle got a weird phone call that directed him to a mechanical engineering book at the public library. Police found a letter inside the book, which in part says, those three dudes you have in custody are just talking to get publicity. The code word for me will be bind them, torture them, kill them, BTK. You will see it again. They will be on the next victim. The letter also included details of the Otero killings that were not yet released. On March 17, 1977, Raider entered a home by the way of a five-year-old who opened the door for him. Raider then locked the boy and his two siblings in the bathroom. He then strangled their mother, Shirley Vianne. The children were able to escape the bathroom and provide the police with a vague description of Raider. On December 8, 1977, Raider used a payphone and reported his latest murder. 
Taylor. He told 911, you will find a homicide at 843 South Parishing. He had bound and strangled Nancy Fox. The following January, he sent an index card imprinted with a poem to the Wichita Eagle. The poem started with, Shirley Locks, Shirley Locks, wilt thou be mine? The mail clerk didn't make the connection to Shirley and thought it was a Valentine's Day note and sent the card to the classified ads department. By February 1978, Raider was getting frustrated with the lack of response to his latest message, so he sent a more direct message to the local news channel. He wrote, How many people do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper or some national attention? He then listed suggested nicknames for himself such as the BTK Stranger, the Wichita Hangman, and the Asphyxiator. After this, the Wichita Police Department called a news conference to the presence of the BTK Stranger in the area. The police chief stated, we have no reason but to believe the individual has the capability to kill again. Anna Williams narrowly missed becoming a victim of Raider. On April 28, 1979, Raider was waiting for Anna to come home and ended up leaving because Anna was taking too long to return home. Raider just had to let Anna know that she was so close to death. Less than two months later, Raider mailed Anna multiple items in the mail which included a poem titled, Oh Anna, Why Didn't You Appear? In August 1979, the police released the recording of Raider's phone call from December 1977 reporting the murder of Nancy Fox. There was a ton of tips that came in from listeners, but there was no relevant information. A task force nicknamed the Ghostbusters was created in 1984 to track down BTK. The task force included an officer named Ken Landwer. Ken carefully organized and preserved valuable evidence. In the spring of 1985, Raider broke into his neighbor's house. Maureen Hedge knew Raider in a casual way. She worked in her yard a lot and would say hello when he walked by. He said it was easy to keep tabs on her. So on April 27th, Raider broke into her house and waited for her to return. When Maureen returned home, she had a man with her. Raider then waited until the man left. He had hid in her bathroom and then flipped on the lights, startling Maureen. He then jumped on the bed and manually strangled her. Raider had moved her body to his car. He then drove until he found a ditch and dumped her body there. He had hid her body with brush. Raider committed what was believed to be his final murder on January 19, 1991. He broke into Dolores Davis's home by throwing a cinder block through her sliding door. He then strangled her to death and dumped her body by a bridge. After this, Raider dropped off the map. He had stopped messaging the media and ceased any more killings. It wasn't until 2004 that Wichita heard from the BTK strangler again. The Wichita Eagle runs a 30th anniversary article on BTK. In the article, it recalled the terror BTK spread in the 70s, and he had since faded from memory. Raider admitted this article encouraged him to revisit his BTK persona. In March 2004, Raider mailed a copy of a driver's license for a missing woman named Vicky. Photos of her body that included the BTK signature, and he sent this to the Wichita Eagle. This linked her unsolved murder to the BTK strangler. May 5, 2004, Raider mailed the local news station a fake ID, some chapter title ideas for a biography, and a find the word letter grid. This spelled out clues such as fantasies and prowl. It was later realized that he had grouped up the letters Raider and they were around the numbers 6220, which was his address. Raider continued leaving messages in public locations. A man found a trash bag with Nancy Fox's driver's license and a Barbie doll with its hands tied behind its back with a hood over its head. Raider kept leaving clues for the police. A postcard that was mailed to the news station directed the police to find a cereal box on the side of the road that contained the graphic details of the Otero family murders. There was also another doll fashioned in a death position. In the postcard, Raider had inquired if his package was found at the local Home Depot. The police then looked around the store and found out that one of the employees had found a cereal box in the back of his truck. The police then searched the employee's trash and found the box. It had a message asking if BTK could communicate through a floppy disk without being traced. The police were told if this was possible then to run an ad in the newspaper with the message Rex, it will be okay. 
The police placed an ad in the Wichita Eagle saying, Rex, it will be okay. Contact me at P.O. Box first for the reference number 67202. Raider sent another postcard six days later. On February 16, 2005, a computer disk arrived in the mail. It was given to cyber cop Randy Stone, who found hidden metadata that revealed the disk was used by quote-unquote Dennis at the Park City Library and Christ Lutheran Church. With a quick internet search for Christ Lutheran Church, it was revealed that the president was Dennis Rader. The police already had DNA evidence that was preserved, and the police learned that Rader's daughter had recently been in the hospital for a pap smear. The police had the hospital turn over the sample to match her DNA to BTK. Rader was arrested February 25, 2005, when he was heading home to have lunch with his wife. He was pulled over by a line of police cars and taken into custody. Rader confessed after being confronted with the DNA evidence. Rader was pissed when he found out that the police had lied to him about not being able to trace him with the computer disk. Rader's arrest was announced the next day at the Wichita City Hall. Rader remained silent at a hearing on April 19th, so the judge entered a non-guilty plea for him. On June 27, 2005, Rader pleaded guilty to 10 counts of first-degree murder. This had caught the prosecutors off guard. Rader then gave explicit details on how he would select, stalk, and kill each of his victims. There was a two-day sentencing hearing that started August 18th. There were testimonies from investigators that described Rader's documentation of his disturbing fantasies and emotional pleas from the victims' families. Rader also gave an apology who expressed his hope that the families would be able to forgive him one day. Rader was sentenced to 10 consecutive life terms in prison for a minimum 175 years without the possibility of parole. Rader didn't receive the death penalty. He had committed the murders before Kansas had reintroduced it in 1994. Raider's daughter had wrote a book called A Serial Killer's Daughter, My Story of Hope, Love, and Overcoming in 2019. The book is about her childhood and relationship with Raider and how she overcame finding out about his crimes. Raider gave his first interview since being convicted. The interview was crazy. Raider claimed he was possessed by demons when he committed his crimes. Raider also claimed he was treated like a pet inside the high-security El Dorado Correctional Facility. Then, in July 2023, he then compared himself to the Gilgo Beach murder suspect. Raider wrote to Fox News Digital calling Rex Humerman a clone of himself. In the fall of 2023, Raider is the prime suspect in three unsolved cases, one in Oklahoma, southeast Kansas, and Missouri. He had been linked to Cynthia Kinney from Oklahoma in 1976, Shauna Beth Garber in Missouri in December of 1990. The young woman from southeast Kansas had disappeared in 1991. She may have been depicted in one of Raider's color sketches that the authorities have had since 2005. Police are performing follow-up interviews and investigating tips from the public. So what do we think? It's very interesting that he was able to stop and wait so long in between killings because I think a lot of serial killers can't mm -hmm. suppress their impulses and it seems like their periods between killing shorten. Yes, because they become more erratic and, and like desensitized to it and they gotta or, keep redoing it to get the same high. Yeah. No, like he would be able to just drop off the map for years at a time. And so as far as we know, his last victims were possibly in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. So then he just went about his regular life. Yeah. I guess. I mean, that we know of. We don't know. You would think, though, as narcissistic as he is, he would be like, oh, you didn't catch this, this, and this, and I did these. So it's just interesting that he hasn't. Yeah, but, I mean, you got to think, when he was arrested, he didn't mention those other three women. Oh, yeah, this is true. They tied him to it later, right? Yeah. Something else that's kind of crazy is that he referred to his victims as projects. Ugh, gross, Which I is know. disgusting. Like, he would stalk them and stuff because he worked for the ADT. Well, and even being a code compliance person, he's yeah. going to be out looking, checking their properties for yard compliance and yeah. animal stuff, right? And writing oh, tickets. I had read about, apparently, that he had complaints when he was a dog catcher. Yes. Like, he was very aggressive mm -hmm. and apparently liked to just basically tell women off and be very rude and 
try to assert his authority over them. Yeah, and I read that he would take a ruler with himself and like put it in the grass and measure the grass and if it was <laughs> anything over, then he would like write him an caring. ordinance, an ordinance <laughs> ticket. Yes, pretty much. <laughs> oh my gosh. One thing that I'd also, I think, came across that was really weird is that he would cut out pictures of women and then draw gags, ties on them. Restraints? Yeah. Blew it to... to like, I guess, like, index cards? But he would carry it's it like, around with him. It's like paper dolls, only for freaks. Like, for... I'm a scrapbook. What I'd like to do. Like, it's just so weird. Kind of sounds like a vision board. Oh, my God. You know? Like, because yeah. we make... We've made vision boards. The and Barbie that dolls, is too. Terrible. so weird. Ugh. And then he thought he was so clever with the cereal boxes. Because cereal killer. It's just so weird. And, you know, what I think's weird is... He had them, like, if it was okay to use that floppy disk, which, idiot, it wasn't. He had them say, Rex, it's okay. Yeah. And then he compares himself to Rex Hewerman. Yeah. That is the Gilgo Beach killer. Yeah. He's the suspect, like. Is that not, like, it's such a weird coincidence that yeah. he would pick that name. And they're both creeps. Yeah. <laughs> they're both creeps. I love it. He was just a weird person. You have to think if he could have kept his ego in check. It was a good possibility he could have got away with all he of this. Have, yeah. It was that 30th anniversary paper that was written about him. And he got so pissed that they're like, it's faded from our memory. And he's like, oh yeah? Watch this. Yep. Idiot. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I just, one, he's terrible. I'm glad he's caught. Like, yes, I'm, obviously. I'm glad he's caught. So apparently he also had a kill kit. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like similar to some of the other serial killers where he would have breaking and entering tools, cords, tapes, hoods, knives, plastic bags, and a gun. So, I mean, all of this is obviously premeditated. So he would stalk people mm -hmm. right down for his projects. It's just so weird that he had time to do this and then had like a family. And a job. And a full-time job. And he just blended in with society. Yeah. If anything, like childhood movies and cartoons are very disappointing because <laughs> the bad people don't look like bad people. Well, yeah, because in cartoons, they always, like, you could always see who the bad yeah, person was. Yeah, they look was. evil. They have these weird, like, huge scars on their face, which I we ain't saying nothing's wrong with that. Like, no, in but they would make the them... eye patch. Why was it always an eye patch? I don't know. Yeah, like in the 80s movies, yeah, like and horror movies and all stuff. All black, just really creepy. It's like. But that's not what killers look like. I mean, this dude was a family they man. They can look like you and me. A church leader. Oh my God, I know, right? When I had read that, because you had written this script, and so I was like, what? Yeah. He had to be like next level manipulator. Oh yeah. To it's... fool that many people for so long. Watching some other videos on YouTube and stuff, there's people that had made references that his wife had pointed out in the newspaper that BTK misspelled the same word that he misspelled really? and I think at one point basically if his wife had found out he had said that he would have killed her to stop protect it. that from him being discovered because do you remember what the word was I don't know but it was like weird I'm sure we can find like his letters that he sent yeah it's so strange because really he said that he felt like BTK and then his family life was the illusion oh it was just to keep him from getting caught so BTK was his true self. Yeah. And which is very interesting. Again, not necessarily as typical murderers go. Able to control himself pretty well. Yeah. Except for that mouth. <laughs> <laughs> need that for attention. Need for attention and yeah, run in his mouth. Did they ever do a psych eval on him? I'm sure there has been. But not then, that that matters, but I'm just curious, other than being a narcissist. and Yeah. So he complains about his parents working a lot and his mom shaming him a few times. But he had a fairly normal childhood. Especially for the time period. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It was a different time. Yeah. Back then and like how they raised children. And mm -hmm. it sounds like his childhood was a typical normal childhood. You know, even if maybe some of the things that were said to kids, they're not okay now. And yeah. You wouldn't do it now. But that was the norm. So it's not like he was treated differently than anybody else no. it didn't sound like not really and no like head traumas or anything yeah because it's always the question of nature versus nurture yeah because there like is that, that argument killers aren't born they're, they're made. made yeah i think this one was born i think that with quite a few people it's interesting that he was 28 when he first committed his first murder if he like he claimed to have these 
fantasy since being a child. And that he was hurting animals. Yeah. That's... But it's like being a teenager that all the going through hormonal changes, puberty. It's interesting that, again, he's able to control himself. So it's just I wonder weird. how old he was when he got married. I wonder if being married and having children contributed to his escape. Maybe. I don't know. Not that it's an excuse. I'm just like, I don't understand. I don't understand any of it. No. And not that we'll ever make sense of it. And it's absolutely horrific what happened to all the people. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure, I think his kids, especially his daughter, she's been very vocal about her childhood and stuff. And I think he was a good father to his kids. I don't think there was any trauma, abuse going on there, neglect, nothing like that. And I think she's put up pictures and it just seems like a normal family. So he just had two sides. Literally. And a really bad side. So what do you guys think? Let us know in the comments below.